Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Judy Halls, and I'm the record specialist for registered designs at the National Archive. In this webinar, which will be about 20 minutes long, I'm going to give you a brief background to the designs and a very broad overview of what's a huge and incredibly varied collection. We'll look at the historical context of the designs and the way changing design trends can be traced through the records from the Victorian Gothic revival to the swinging 60s. People wouldn't necessarily think of coming to the National Archives to research design, but in fact we hold design resources of national importance covering the early years of Queen Victoria's reign through to 1991. The registered designs are designs that were copyrighted under a series of Acts of Parliament from 1839 onwards. As part of the registration process, applicants had to submit two copies of their designs. Each was stamped or labelled with an individual registered design number. One was returned to the copyright holder and the other would be pasted into an enormous bound volume and retained by the designs registry, originally at Somerset House in London. The designs registry was part of the Board of Trade, a government department. Because they were government records, they eventually came to the National Archives for safekeeping. We now have almost 3 million designs registered for copyright between 1839 and 1991. The records are divided into two types, the representations and the registers. The registers give the name and address of the copyright holder, known as the proprietor, the registered design number and date of registration, and sometimes a brief description of the object being registered. Alongside the registers are the volumes containing representations. The representations are drawings, photographs, samples, and sometimes whole objects like gloves or hats, which were submitted at the time of registration, each with a design number corresponding to the register entry. The representations range from samples and sometimes original designs by well-known names like William Morris or Coco Chanel, through to ordinary everyday objects that people would have used in the home, or textiles they would have used for their clothing or furnishings. The design records at the National Archives came about as a result of the introduction of copyright for decorative design. In the first half of the 19th century, textiles, furniture and decorative goods were being mass-produced in a plethora of styles, and it was a period of revivals. Rococo, Renaissance, Gothic and Classical styles were all popular. There was increasing concern about the poor quality of British design and the difficulty of competing in international markets. This was attributed to increasing mechanisation, so that quantity increased at the expense of quality. It was felt that there was a loss of status and employment for skilled craftsmen and that their skills were being degraded. There was also concern about what was deemed to be poor taste on the part of the general public, fed by increasing affluence, the availability of cheap goods, constantly changing fashions and a lack of opportunities to see examples of so-called good taste. Piracy or copying of designs was also a major concern and was thought to further undermine the quality of design. Manufacturers didn't want to spend a lot of money on a design if it was going to be copied or reproduced as a cheaper and inferior product, in much the same way as, it is, as designer clothing is copied today. It was growing concern about the quality of British design and about copying of designs that led to the creation of the design records at the National Archives. In 1835, a select committee was set up to look at the reasons for the poor standard of British design. It concluded that steps needed to be taken to improve the taste of manufacturers, designers and the general public. This would have the effect of creating a demand for better design. Steps also needed to be taken to curb piracy of designs. In 1836, the report of the select committee made three key recommendations. Museums and galleries should be established where the general public could go to see examples of good design. Exposure to examples of so-called good taste would encourage consumers to demand better design. 
Schools of design should be set up where artisans could go to be educated and trained to recognise and produce better designs. And a copyright system should be established for all ornamental designs, similar to the one that already existed in France. The third recommendation, a system of copyright for ornamental designs, was implemented in 1839 and is where the registered designs come into the picture, as the examples held at the archives today were originally submitted as evidence of copyright. The drive to improve design gave rise to what became known as the design reform movement. The influential civil servant and design reformer Henry Cole and his circle strove to establish a framework of rules applied to design, to a didactic to say the least. Cole set up the Museum of Ornamental Art, later to become the Victoria and Albert Museum, where he put on an exhibition called False Principles in Decoration. This illustrated where British manufacturers were going wrong in his view. The chief of vices, according to Cole, was the direct imitation of nature, demonstrated by the carpet design on the bottom right, which features realistic flowers and lacks a symmetrical pattern. Another faux pas was to mix different styles within one design, as in, as in this furniture fabric, which has Spanish bullfighting scenes and a chintz design mixed together, and the wallpaper, which is imitating metal and also has a three-dimensional effect. Only so-called so flat patterns were deemed appropriate for a flat wall. The decoration of an object should be true to the nature of the object. What looks like a stuffed box does not reflect the nature of a footstool. The registered designs are full, full of what the design reformers thought of as horrors, and a look through them suggests that flowery wallpaper and carpets never went out of fashion. We also hold many examples of the work of the design reformers themselves, including Augustus Pugin, Owen Jones and Richard Redgrave, as well as what might be called the second wave of reformers, including William Morris, Christopher Dresser, E. W. Godwin and Walter Crane. The wallpaper on the top left, designed by Owen Jones, has the kind of flat geometrical pattern deemed appropriate for a flat surface. Three-dimensional effects were to be avoided. Similarly, the tile by Pugin has a flat pattern and doesn't attempt to imitate nature. It demonstrates his tendency to include improving text as part of his designs. The companion tile to this one wasn't registered strangely. The text should read Dominus Providavit or The Lord Will Provide. Pugin pioneered the Gothic revival and had a huge influence on later design reformers. He believed that Gothic design was associated with the Christian values of a pre-industrial age and with morality. A nation's art was a symptom of its moral health. He, he associated morality with design in a quite literal way, believing that design and architecture should be honest. For example, furniture and buildings should reveal their structure. He thought that fabrics and wallpaper should have flat patterns pretending to be something else, for example, by having realistic three-dimensional effects, he regarded as dishonest. The Granville chair shown here was designed by Pugin's son, Edward Welby Pugin. The form is simple, with the functional elements not disguised, but instead central to the design. The, clear, the chair clearly shows the link between Pugin's precepts and those of the arts and crafts movement later in the century. The early wallpaper by William Morris on the bottom right shows the use of flat patterns and was inspired by medieval illuminated manuscripts. The design reformers' principles didn't impress everyone. The influential critic John Ruskin was offended by the idea of a rule-bound system. He believed that each individual craftsman should get their own inspiration from nature, and many designers formed their own ideas about what constituted good taste. The registered designs allow us to trace changes in style over time. Around 1860, ideas about the links between fine and decorative art began to change in a way that had a profound effect on the development of style. The activities of so-called art furnishers, 
promoted a new attitude towards design by producing furniture that was thought to be artistic. At first, this was a minority taste promoted by people like William Morris and his associates, but by the end of the century, the term artistic came to denote the latest in design. The National Archives holds at least 50 William Morris samples of wallpapers and textiles, including trellis shown here on the right, which was the first wallpaper design by Morris, Marshall, Faulkner and Co, set up by Morris with members of the Free Raphaelite group. Trellis was designed by Morris for the Red House, his first home with his new wife, Jane Burden. The house was described by the artist Edward Byrne Jones as the beautifulest place on earth. The birds for this design were drawn by the architect of the Red House, Philip Webb. We hold a number of original Morris & Co designs as opposed to samples, including the furniture fabric design on the left. From the 1870s onwards, the aesthetic movement became hugely popular. This saw a move away from an association of moral values with design. Instead, its slogan was art for art's sake. Walter Crane, who designed the wallpaper on the bottom left, called Swan, Brush and Iris, was one of the key designers associated with the aesthetic movement and also campaigned to improve design. Other key figures were Bruce Talbot, who designed the wallpaper on the top left, and E.W. Godwin, who designed this ebonised chair. The volumes of representations are full of designs that use the aesthetic movement symbols of sunflowers, peacocks, blue and white china, Japanese fans and furniture ebonised in imitation of Japanese style. As well as having records of ornamental designs, we also hold records of what were termed useful designs or designs of utility. This came about because of the expense and difficulty inventors found in patenting their designs. By the first half of the 19th century, the patent system had become notoriously expensive and inefficient, giving rise to a vociferous reform movement. Much to the annoyance of the registrar of designs, inventors began registering objects that were useful as opposed to purely ornamental. A solution came about in the form of the 1843 Utility Designs Act, which provided copyright protection for designs described as not being of an ornamental character, but instead for any article of manufacture having reference to some purpose of utility, in other words, useful inventions. Under the Act, proprietors were given three years copyright protection, the Act also addressed a growing feeling that the patent system should be reserved for important inventions and not household or everyday items, although in reality a mixture of the two can be found among the designs that were registered. At the end of the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century, we can begin to see Art Nouveau designs being registered. Liberties commissioned work by many of the top aesthetic designers of the period, but they were always registered by Liberty and sold under the Liberty name. They didn't advertise who their designers were. The spoon on the top left was designed by Archibald Knox for Liberties, possibly to celebrate the coronation of Edward VII. Attribution was possible by finding an example of the finished product held at the British Museum. The unassuming looking Thebes stool on the bottom right was also registered by Liberties and became something of a style classic, selling in huge numbers. The textiles you see here show the move away from formal flat patterns towards far more free flowing designs. From 1908 onwards, we see modernist designs as well as Art Nouveau and more traditional Edwardian designs. In 1914, a number of designs were registered by the Omega workshops set up by Roger Fry. These include designs by Fry himself, as well as other members of the Bloomsbury group. Only a very short time later, there are drab khaki and grey textile designs registered by the War Office as the First World War broke out. In the 1930s, we can see some great examples of Art Deco design. The bottom two designs shown here were registered by the Calico Printers Association, 
formed in 1899 as an amalgamation of 46 print works and 13 merchant businesses. It totaled about 85% of the calico printing industry in Britain. Many of the firms kept their specialisms and encouraged their designers to explore abstract patterns and the latest colours, resulting in some really inventive and lively designs. As well as thinking about design movements and named designers, the registered designs offer the opportunity for many other research approaches, particularly the study of material culture. They give an amazing insight into the kinds of small ephemeral items people had in their homes, covering everything from clay pipes, bird cages and candlesticks to laundry blue, soap and board games. There are designs for toys, clothes, musical instruments and all kinds of gadgets. There are many commemorative items reflecting important events. For example, the Gladstone for the Million Plate, shown here, marking Gladstone's election as Prime Minister, and designs to mark births and deaths, like this commemorative Thomas Carlyle jug, as well as memorabilia related to the Crimean and Boer Wars. This is a taster of the vast range of more modern designs, which are really amazing and very little explored. The Mickey Mouse design shown here is a photo of the earliest Disney merchandise, which was made by Dean's Rag Book Company. The iconic Rally Chopper bike was registered in 1968, and the guitar was registered by James Ormston Burns, a maker whose guitars were bought by well-known names, including Elvis Presley, Hank Marvin, and Jimmy Page. This mannequin was registered by Adele Hopkins, born Adele Rootstein, who designed high-end mannequins based on real models, including Twiggy and Joanna Lumley, using new fiberglass technology. There are any number of different research rabbit holes it's possible to go down, and any box of designs can be opened to reveal the fashions and fads of a, of a given period. These design records have accumulated simply as they were brought into the designs registry to be copyrighted. This means that as well as work by major designers, there are hundreds of thousands of designs by unknown designers working for large manufacturers. Unlike designs held by museums or galleries, they haven't been collected or curated on the basis of decisions about the historical or cultural significance of the artefacts, making them completely unique. I hope I've given you a snapshot of what's a huge and fascinating record series. Thank you for listening.